Hi there, and thanks for joining us online today. Uh, my name is Laura, and I'm a part of the team here at the People's Church in Constantia in Cape Town. We are currently in the middle of a series called Life Together. For these few weeks, we are inviting you to take a journey with us, um, just like experiencing the beauty of the local church and, and the way that Jesus intended for it to be, especially in the society where, where our time and our brain space feels like a rare commodity um, and, and, and being stressed is just normal. It's not even abnormal, it's just our everyday. Feeling anxious is normal. Feeling like there are more demands in our life than we can handle is normal. And I think to some extent, we've taken the mantra of my life, I, you know, I'll manage mine, you manage yours. Um, I'll manage my own spirituality on my own terms, in my own time, when I have space. However, in Ephesians, Paul is painting a totally different picture. And today we will look at what it could be if we perhaps pressed into this idea of what the church really is meant to be. Now, just before I read, I find that context is helpful. So the city of Ephesus, where all of this played out, um, th this city was a buzzing port city. It was quite secular, quite promiscuous, socially quite ruthless. There was no s s uh, trace of social justice. And, and Ephesus, you can see on the map, uh, is in Turkey. And when Paul was writing these letters to church to the church in Ephesus, he was actually in prison in Rome. And he was writing to them, the Ephesian people who had responded to the gospel and formed the church. And he was writing with a sense of urgency about things that they cannot forget. In, in case something happens to him, these were things that they absolutely had to get right. Now, last week, Hans spoke about the, the mystery of the church and how it all fits together. And if you didn't see that, go back and watch it. It was a really good message. Um, but, but he spoke about how there's purpose and beauty found in this togetherness in, in theory and in reality. But the reality sometimes comes with its obstacles. I reckon this d diverse group of people who came together, uh, who had nothing in common with each other except that they've all received grace, they sometimes had a little bit of potential for some agreements and Paul knew it. So let's read from Ephesians. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, He has given each of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. And, and then Paul has this by the way kind of thought that he, he inserts, which is very important, but I'm just gonna continue to verse 11. Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And in this very important last verse, this will continue until, you know when you say, sorry, just side note, when you say, I need to work out and exercise until I am fit enough to run a marathon, or I need to practice this until I get it right. So he says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord measuring up to the full and complete standard 
of Christ. Let's just pray quickly. Jesus, thank you that even as we are watching and even as I'm speaking now, you are present with us. And so God, we pray that you would come and you would do a work in our hearts. I pray that you would bring revelation in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know who of you have experienced disappointment in real life versus your expectation of things, I'm sure all of us. Um, before you get married, if you're married, you might know this. If not, let me tell you something. Before you get married, you've got certain expectations. And, um, and you know, you, you think it's going to be rosy and peachy. Like I kind of imagine it like a never ending sleepover, you know. Finally, you don't have to go home at night and, and we get to stay together. Um, we were basically just signing up for an eternal slumber party, right? <laughs> um, I mean, not quite that, not quite that ignorant. However, I don't think we were prepared for what real life, real daily nitty gritty life would look like living with another person who came from a different family, who did things different to you. I wasn't anticipating these things being all over my house. I wasn't anticipating them leaving their shoes at the door for me to trip over every day. I, I wasn't anticipating that they'd eat my snacks that I so intentionally prepared for myself. I, I wasn't anticipating that they would think it's okay to use my toothbrush. I mean, all hypothetical, of course. <laughs> and as much as I still think this is the best decision I've ever made, I did not quite anticipate how difficult being married would be at some point or at, on some days. And Paul was speaking to a church who was finger, figuring out that, that the fact that they all received salvation and, and forgiveness and that they all served the same God was not simply enough to get them to work together. They brought all of their previous life experience into the mix. All their personality flaws and quirks were brought into the mix. They brought their different cultural expectations into the mix. And, and most of it probably unconsciously. And it, this would make decision making very difficult. It's easy to offend each other by accident because of that. Uh, you know, it made misunderstanding so common and it made simple things like eating together and, and being together full of nuance and intensity. And it, may, it made some people to even think of just leaving the community altogether because it was just too difficult sometimes. Have you ever been in such a situation? Maybe you can think of one, but Paul was begging them to make it work, to bear with one another. It literally says that in the NIV. And you know what bearing means? It means put up with difficult things. So just bear with it. It's going to be difficult to, to make allowance for each other's faults because there was something that they needed to achieve. And the only way for them to achieve and get that thing was through their unity. Now, unity, this word, if you've been in church for a while, I'm sure you've heard it many times. If you don't have a church background, that's okay. Either way, I think sometimes we don't really get what the big deal behind it is. I love Jesus, you have Jesus, you do it there, I do it here. Why make it harder than it has to be? So, so hold that thought because there are some answers in Genesis about this. So I'm going to read from Genesis on the, in the creation story. We're going to be on that day when God made the humans. What a beautiful story. So Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Notice he didn't say me, I, us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. 
male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. In our image. Just a disclaimer, I feel like I'm going into, into territory here that my own brain can't fully wrap around, but I do believe that there's something, there's something so beautiful and something so powerful that we can grasp, even if it's just a little bit, when we try and understand something about this, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, unity. I don't think our minds can ever fully wrap around it. Firstly, the title, God, shared by three but one. There was total submission from each part of the Trinity. There was perfect understanding. There was perfect love and, and total confidence in each other. I am God, you are God, you are God, we're all God. I, I, as I said, I don't fully get it, but, but there's something about it that if you imagine this to be in our own world, three people or three different personalities sharing the title God, it would never fly. But there's something so powerful about this idea. And out of perfect unity and perfect love, they created the world and then they got to the great finale, the ultimate act of extending their unity and love. They made human beings and it says, let's make them in our image like us. We were made to reign. That was our original job description. To be fruitful, I reckon in more than one way, to multiply and to, and to fill the earth. We were meant to govern and to take what has already been created and develop it further. We weren't given a pretend job, you know, like you give to a toddler when they want to help because you need to get things done and just keep them busy. No, we were given a real job, almost like God outsourced a part of his own job to us. Wonder, what a wonderful thought that we were made with that kind of capacity. God always intended on including us in his story of building this beautiful world. And we were made meant to do this job in perfect unity with God. It's mind boggling because it takes quite a lot of trust to, to, to give someone such an important job. However, when there's perfect love, there's no fear. Perfect unity. unity. Imagine creating a, a, to a world in total agreement with each other. You know, we've got a saying that says you can't have too many cooks in the kitchen. It's true because we don't know how to work together. I mean, Hans and I, <laughs> bless us, God is helping us. We can't even come up with a series title in agreement with each other, never mind making systems and, and galaxies with intricate, you know, DNA structures. I mean, can you imagine? Are you still following? I don't know if you're with me, but I hope you are. So it says that we're made in their image. And there are lots of qualities of God that we resemble and that we were created for. But, but here is the thing that I'm trying to get to. Imprinted into our very DNA, we were made to live in unity, in community. If we were made as an expression of perfect love and perfect unity, you can be sure that at the very core of not just our spiritual and emotional beings, but our physical body, we are made to live in unity firstly with God and secondly 
with other people, with each other. Adam and Eve were created for each other. And this goes far beyond marriage. This is also just speaks about as human beings, we were made for togetherness, to operate and to be effective and simply exist in togetherness with others. Of course, we know that there was a fall. Adam and Eve, they ate that fruit and and sin came into the picture. And although our capacity for love and, and this commission that we were given didn't necessarily change, we no longer lived in perfect unity with God and with one another. Our motivations and our intentions were skewed. Fear came into the picture. Pride came into the picture, leading us to the belief that we can do it all on our own. I don't need anybody else. And we started living like little gods, except without the love and the submission part, just demands, wants. So there is a massive backstory to this whole unity thing. It's not just the church lingo that we're like, come on guys, work together. No, this is something built into who we are. Look how togetherness is printed into our physical bodies. A study published in this year, 2023, says um, loneliness and social isolation can be as damaging to an individual's health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And the National um, Academies of Sciences found that loneliness among heart failure patients was associated with around a four times increased risk of death and a 68% increased risk of hospitalization. It's also true that England now has a minister of loneliness. It's so damaging to our society that secular governments are seeing the need to intervene. You know, funerals are often a place where you see whether a person was someone who lived in togetherness, in community, or not. And just to clarify, you know, having people around you doesn't make you not on your own. It's when we have a purposeful space in a community, when we have a role of some sort, something that will cause us to be missed, that gives us a sense of true togetherness. So now I wanna ask you a question. Looking at your daily and your weekly rhythms, where do you think the trajectory of your life is heading? as far as this matter goes, as far as living in togetherness goes. I heard a saying that said, the way you live your days is the way you're living your life. How is our day and our, sp uh, and our weeks, is there space in them for togetherness? Or is it just a full on hustle full time? I'll leave that question with you for a moment. You can come back to that if you wish. Now, coming back to this Ephesian church that we started off with, as I've said, these individuals, they heard this good news about Jesus and, and, and about this God with his perfect love who gave themselves for them so that they may have life and have it to the full. And, and they responded. And what Paul did was he, he put all these people together and he said, listen, now, now you guys come together and you learn together, you eat together, you drink together, you, you break the same loaf of bread together, you sing together, you pray for each other that you may grow in and, and, and your faith. And, and as you come together, God will shape you and make you to be the people and the community that he's always intended for you to be as individuals and as a group. And last week, Hans used this illustration of, of Plato and saying how these different people from totally different communities and backgrounds and beliefs came together. And, and it was this weird sort of awkward thing of like, we don't look the same, we don't talk the same, we don't dress the same, we don't feel the same, but, but 
we've all received grace. And now we're in this one community and God is making a new humanity and, and it's beautiful. He's shaping it. And we can see the beauty from the outside. Look at all this diversity and color. But do you know what? As I'm squishing this and as, as God is forming his church, None of us like to be squeezed. None of us like to be pressed into a corner. None of us like to be told what to do and where to go and where to sit. None of us like to be overlooked because, you know, this other person has seen a lot more than me. This is not fun. As much as it is beautiful what God is making, we have to acknowledge that the process of being shaped, the process of being made into this humanity that God has always made us to be, it's going against something of our broken humanity. It's going against something of our convenience. We like to do what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. And when we enter into this community of saying, I'm now one with others. It's not just about me anymore. It can become a little bit uncomfortable. It's good for us to acknowledge that and to understand that being a part of the church is not always rosy and butterflies and, and, and good feelings. At point, at times it will be uncomfortable. But see, as God is shaping this beautiful picture, something mysterious and beautiful happens. Something sacred happens. It's not natural. It's supernatural. Just like when a couple gets married, it's sacred. It's not just legal papers that I sign, but God brings a unity about. And see, I think we're all on board for the most part, for the big picture, for the, I want to see Africa saved. You want to see Africa saved. We all want to see Africa saved. I love, I want to love Jesus more. You want to love Jesus more. We all want to love Jesus more. That's usually not the issue. The issue comes with the nitty gritty stuff, with the move up. You're taking up too much space. It's when we sit at the table and we say, well, I prepared food and, and the others will actually, I don't eat that. Or, or you know, saying, but, but I worked really hard and you're refusing to eat it. Or, or perhaps someone disagrees with what you said and it really offended them. How can you say such a thing? Or, or maybe someone else said, listen, I, I invited you to, to my party and, and then I saw photos and it, and you didn't invite me. That's quite hurtful and offensive to me. Or, or perhaps saying, you know, I've always been overlooked. I'm always at the bottom for when new things are chosen and you've never given me an opportunity. And, and this is the kind of stuff that people leave churches over. And I know as I'm mentioning it, maybe you're thinking, this, this is such menial things, seriously. But this is where we get stuck. And instead of pushing through and, and insisting that we work together, that we find a way to win, instead of doing that, we're actually saying, you know what, I, I'm out. This is just too difficult. I don't, I, I still love Jesus, but, but this thing, this blob of, of, of losing myself and my rights, it's just too difficult. This is the reality. As a church, we will never change the world unless we allow ourselves to be changed first. The Christian journey is as much about making a difference as it is about allowing myself to be made different. And this is why it's so necessary for us to be a part of the church. This is why, this is where we come face to face with our own brokenness, first of all, and the brokenness of others. And it forces us to revisit the fact that our only hope has ever been grace. Grace from Lord Jesus Christ that, that he's redeemed us, but grace from others as well. The only reason I am even a part of this is grace. 
unpopular opinion for a moment. As much as I myself love a good conference and a good Christian event where there's hype and, 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 and just wonderful togetherness, that is not how we get to the place that Paul described in verse 13, where he said, mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. If we just become people who frequent conferences and Christian events, but we don't belong to a local church and we don't give of ourselves to that local church, it sometimes produces Christians with a, with a highly impressive Christian vocabulary and a very low level of maturity. We grow and we mature and we become more like Jesus through serving at our local church, through working in teams, through disagreeing at times, and then learning to put yourself aside for the sake of unity, learning how to apologize for your prideful attitude. It's, it's learning how to submit your own agenda and your ideas and your gifting for the greater group and the bigger group. And for sure, there's a space for it and there's a time for it but realizing that it's not all about me all the time. And if this makes you uncomfortable and you're thinking, geez, like, I don't even know if I want to be a part of it. You're not alone. <laughs> These ideas and this, this truth, it makes me uncomfortable too. You know, our South African context can, be, can relate so well to this Ephesian church. Our country is wildly diverse and not just racially, even within our racial groups, there's so, such a wide spectrum of cultures. And even within the cultures, there's this, this big representation of different socioeconomic backgrounds. And we encounter this broad spectrum of diversity on a daily basis in our country. But often we find that the people we choose to hang out with, the people we invite to our brides are the people who are like us. And that's not necessarily wrong. It's just because it's comfortable. You talk like me, you laugh at my jokes. I'm not too scared I'm going to offend you because we kind of think the same way. Except that maybe I think it leaves us a little bit one dimensional at times and a little bit poorer for, for it. God is, is trying to shape something in us. I said to a friend the other day, you know, South Africa is a complex place because because we're so different and, and our country is constantly bruised and, and, and sensitive because of blows of division and corruption and injustice. And often as a South African from a certain background, you, you, you do desire, you want to step over the line, the invisible line of your culture across to a different culture. But when you get to that place, you, you're so uncomfortable because you don't know how to be, you're, you don't know what to say, you're not always sure what's okay and what's not. And because it's uncomfortable, you're like, actually it's hard, I'm just gonna go back to where it's comfortable. I retreat back into my own bubble, missing out on what could have been if only I had stayed. And see, this is the thing about the church. Paul is saying, I'm forcing you guys, the only way to win here, the only way to do and become what God wants us to be is to step over the line, to press into that uncomfortable space. We are meant to cross over and stay. And because of the fall, when, when we who are different come together, it's so uncomfortable. But the humanity that God had in mind when he created us, when they created us, is that all of us from every tribe and every tongue would come together celebrating the diverse majesty of God through seeing each other, experiencing the richness of God's image and character. And the reason this whole thing of unity is such a big deal is not so we can be a holy huddle of us against the world, but so that we become what God has always intended for us to be. You know, this church family is much, much, much more than the people that you happen to see if you come to church on the same Sunday. 
These are the people who are meant to pray for your prayer requests as if their lives depended on it. These are the people who will shout blessings and upon blessings over, <coughs> sorry, over your children when they are being blessed at church. They're the ones cheering for you. These are the people who will bring eats and, and platters to your funeral one day when your time comes to meet Jesus. These are your people. So what am I getting at? How are we meant to respond to this? And I realize that you are watching online and you're not necessarily sitting in a room full of fellow Christians. And perhaps you're not able to join us in person. Maybe you live far away. But I do believe that there's a way for us to be a part of a purposeful community. And I believe that as Christians, we can become more intentional about stepping over the line of climbing out of our bubble, whether it is over a culture line or sometimes just out of our comfort. How can I be a blessing to someone else? How can I make my life count for someone else? And so a practice for this week. Maybe we can find an intentional space where we can serve someone. Maybe bring a meal to someone's house and say, can I eat here with you? Or, or maybe, you know, take someone out to get their groceries done, knowing that maybe they're alone. Maybe you're that person who's alone. You know, the way into a community or into a friend's life is not through demanding something from them, but rather choosing to serve them. Who can you serve? this week. I'm going to pray. Jesus, help us. Help us to become the people and the church as a whole that you had in mind. Form us and shape us and lead us. And we may we be people who serve and who are a blessing to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.